Hello, and welcome to the heart of Fiat Crucified Love. This week, we're going to talk about, well, here, I guess I got to move over, the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I didn't have a good place to hang my little prints of theirs. Um, they cover up my electrical box, usually. I guess I should get a frame. But these are just such beautiful images. And we're in the month of, no of November, of June. And June is the month of the Sacred Heart. And um, in June, we celebrate both the Feast of the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart. And so I thought it would be good to meditate on these. This podcast will come out about a week after um, those feast days. But the whole month, we're supposed to be meditating on the Sacred Heart of Jesus and then the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And it was really on my heart to do a podcast on truth, beauty, and love. So I decided to um, combine these because the heart of Jesus Christ and the heart of Mary, um, they are both furnaces and um, sources. I'm thinking in Russian, istochnik, but the source or the fountain um, of truth, of beauty, and of love, right? Because the Holy Spirit lives fully in both of them. He lives in a more divine way in Jesus because Jesus is also God. But Our Lady was also full of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to talk about those three things because my entire life is given and dedicated to speaking truth and creating beauty and answering whatever the Lord gives me in love. So I'm, I just want to talk about that a little bit. I didn't prepare a whole lot because I knew the Holy Spirit would just tell me what to say. You know, I have a scripture passage and, and then we will spend the hour talking about the heart of Jesus and the heart of Mary and those three things, truth and beauty and love. So at the beginning, we will do a prayer and... Um, just a praise, a very simple praise and worship song. I'm sorry, you'll have to have Our Lady blocked as I sing the opening song. But let's begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we will be recreated recreated in truth, recreated in beauty, and recreated in love. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth.
Alleluia. Okay, so it's the end of a long day. I didn't get my podcast recorded over the weekend. Um, I always have a rule that people come before anything, and my family, several times I had calls and things come up that I needed to attend to. So it is Monday evening, but I think with the late nights, I'll get this in before it's too dark. But that's why my voice is a little rusty. I'm going on four hours of sleep and a very long day with two little rambunctious girls. So, um, but I think the Lord on my way home said, you know, record this when you get home. And so um, he's going to provide. And I want to open with that passage that I had kind of put aside here. It's one of my favorites. I remember years ago when I was um, staying with my sister and a bunch of her little kids, I taught them this by heart. And um, they used to say, now remember, Aunt Mary, you know, whatever is true, whatever is good, you know, and they would recite this passage. So I'm just going to read it to you. It's from Philippians. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. Keep on doing what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And then the God of peace will be with you. So I'm going to read it one more time. Finally, brothers and sisters, right? Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things and keep on doing what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. And then the great God of peace will be with you. I have so much to say. <laughs> I use this passage sometimes as um, a check for my own interior life. And you could use it as an examination of conscience as well. But when I feel overwhelmed with a suffering or a darkness or something's kind of coming at me, I always say to myself, now, Mary, is this true? You know, Satan is the father of lies. He tries to make us think things that aren't true. Or he throws other people's lies at us, right? So is this true? Is this honorable, right? Are these thoughts just? I always add merciful to. Is this pure? Is it lovely? Is it beautiful? Is it gracious? Is it worthy of praise? Is it excellent, right? Then you can think about those things. But if the answer is no, forget it. Don't even, don't even think about it. God will take care of the situation. You know, I started to reflect most profoundly on truth and beauty and love. Um, when I was in Russia, because there seemed to be such an absence of those things when I was a missionary there. Maybe it's appropriate. I've got on the other side over my shoulder the icon from the, the front of my book on Russia that I did. But um, it was such a suffering, and I know it wasn't just me, you know, being negative or something, because it was a conversation that we often had with the missionaries. And I remember a missionary sister pulling me aside once and saying, why is it that things are so ugly and so messed up, right? Disorganized, dark, um, lies, you know, filled everything. People's hearts were cold. They just step over a, a bleeding man on the street or somebody who is dying from alcoholism. And... Um, you know, children were left alone at night in the streets. And why is it there was a lack of love and a lack of beauty and a lack of truth? And the Lord showed me so clearly that it was because there was a lack of him, right? 
God himself is truth and God is beauty. Anything that you think is beautiful in this world um, comes from a God who's way more beautiful than whatever that is that you, um, you know, you stand in awe of. And different people have different perceptions of what's beautiful. Although I think that everyone would agree that, you know, a beautiful sunset over a mountain, you know, is beautiful. There are some things that everyone agrees. Maybe you have different forms of, um, of art or things like that. But, you know, anything that we see that's beautiful is a reflection of the creator. And he, God is like this divine artist. And if you study, like, it's so beautiful. If you study, um, like, the, it's something to do with, like, the numerology of music. And, like, music, when they, like, do it with light and numbers and stuff. Like, I think numbers are really boring. But it is so beautiful when they graph out what music is, right? And... Um, that's because it comes from God. When you study DNA or cells and you, you know, you go into outer space and you look at galaxies and stars, like everything that comes from the heart of God is beautiful, right? And God is truth and God is truth incarnate. Jesus Christ is the, the way, the truth, and the life, right? He is our light and light. When you shine light on something, the truth of it kind of comes out, right? That's why when people do something wrong or if they're ashamed of themselves, you know, they want to hide in, in darkness. Um, you know, when people don't think that they're very attractive, they don't, they want to stay in the dark. They don't want a, a bright picture of themselves in light. I've met people who won't let you take pictures because they don't like the truth of who they are. And it's sad because they are beautiful in the eyes of God for who they are but they don't see it that way. And everything that comes forth from God is truth. And, you know, that's what true humility is too. Humility is the truth about who you are and the truth about who God is. And, you know, even if you are a really sinful person, um, the truth of God's love and mercy and what he's done to redeem that sinfulness and to transform you is so beautiful. You have to have them together. That the love of God makes you beautiful. You know, even if, if you don't feel like in yourself you are. But humility re recognizes that all comes from God, right? Every, every atom of our being comes from God. And when people are close to God, God cannot lie, right? Satan is the, the king of lies. But God just speaks truth. In fact, his words are so purely truth that that's how the world was made. He said, let there be light. And reality follows his word because his word is truth, right? So there was light. He said, let there be fish and there were fish. Let there be man in my image. Let there be woman in my image. And so the word of God is efficacious, it's truth. And Jesus was that word and Jesus came to earth as truth incarnate. In fact, I remember being really awed um, at Notre Dame in one of my mandatory theology classes. I think it was Professor Warrico. And I remember where I was sitting and him showing us something and I want to say it was from origin but I'm, I don't remember exactly, but I'll never forget learning this, that the early philosophers that lived before Jesus could technically be called Christians because their logic followed truth and Jesus is truth incarnate. So they were following a Christ who hadn't even revealed himself yet in the history of man. That's why when you go to places like Russia that might have communism and a lack of faith in God, when you meet people who follow truth, they behave in a Christian way because God is truth. So God is truth. God is beauty. And of course, God is love, right? That's all over scripture. John loves to say that, but it's all over. God is love, right? Jesus obviously says it as well. So when I was in Russia, you, you saw a lack of this because there was a lack of God. 
And so when the human heart loses God, who is the source of truth and beauty and love, then those things begin to, to rot away or fall away from, from the way that people live and then what they create. So in these cities where God was destroyed, buildings would come up and things would be built that would have no color, no beautiful form, no shape. It was all concrete slabs. There wasn't any beauty. And you'd even go to government offices and you would see where nothing made sense. There wasn't logic. There wasn't truth. And people lied all the time. Why? Because they didn't have their heart resting in God, right? And there was such a lack of love. You know, someone would come in and murder a neighbor and the baby who witnessed it would be screaming all night. And the neighbors knew it. But they didn't have the courage that comes from true, authentic love to go and take care of that baby. Truth and beauty and love, they're all very connected. And it's interesting because um, you become what you think about, right? What you think about really affects your life in a powerful way. And there's actually um, an Eastern Orthodox like wise man, you know, they're called Straniki sometimes, but he wrote, I think his name is Tadeus, and he's from Serbia, if I'm thinking of the right one, but he wrote an incredible book called Our Thoughts to Determine Our Lives. And what he teaches is that what you think affects the world around you. Well, in essence, that's what is being written here in St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, right? Because he's saying you know, only put, you know, in another place it says, put on the mind of Christ. But here, what does he say? Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure and lovely and gracious, think about those things. Why? Because if you think about whatever is true, then you will live an authentic life that radiates truth, right? And if you think about what is honorable, you will live honorably. You know, honor is something that's been lost in today's world. People aren't polite. They don't write thank yous. They don't say please and thank you. Um, they don't respect their elders. Um, they just don't live nobly or honorably. Some people do, but just the majority of culture doesn't understand that. And something I really try to instill in the children that I take care of, you know, whether they be nieces and nephews I visit, but they don't really need it because their parents do too, right? Or other children that you teach honor and you teach, you know, to be a noble person. Well, if you think about those things, then that's how you behave. That's how you speak. You know, you speak courteous and polite words. You're not vulgar. You know, there's nothing more you know, disastrous to me that when I hear a small child say something vulgar because they heard it come from their parents. And it doesn't have to be a, like a swear word, like that's awful, but it can just be something that's not quite so polite, right? So we're called to think about honorable things and then we'll behave honorably, right? And like, what else does it mean to be honorable? To admit your faults, to, um, to be respectful, um, to be honest, right? Those are all honorable things. Whatever is just. You know, you hear the word just and people tend to get afraid sometimes because they think, well, I want God who's merciful because, you know, they think of justice as being like this, this mean, screamy, violent, beady father, you know, or something. But God, who is all mercy, is also all just. And that's our hope because not only justly do we deserve hell for our sins, right? But Jesus died on the cross and won eternal life for us. And so justice is that we receive what he gave us, which is that. And, you know, I think every person, regardless of what your religious affiliation is, can see injustice and it bothers you. It bothers you in the world when you see something that's it's not fair to another person, right? You know, maybe their reputation was, was stolen or ruined by calumny and lies. Maybe they worked really hard and they weren't paid a fair wage. 
you know, maybe they made a little mistake, but the law says that this should happen and they end up like losing their apartment and losing like all these things. It just doesn't seem very just. Maybe they've done something wrong and another will not extend forgiveness because forgiveness is just. We who have been completely forgiven by God, it is just that we offer and share some of that with our neighbors who've offended us. So we need to think about things that are just, but justice and mercy are not separate. Justice and mercy go together. The mercy of God is just, and it's justice that we extend mercy. Those two things are, are, are very interconnected because they're both a form of love. So if we think about things that are just, then we behave justly, right? And that's a part of truth, right? Truth, truth is very just. Whatever is pure, you know, truth is pure. Truth is pure. And that's why, like, look at something even like um, the marital act, right? If you have the marital act, you have two people who are naked, giving themselves in body, mind, heart, and soul, and spirit to each other. That is pure within marriage. And their nakedness and their gift is more pure than if they didn't have it. They have nothing covering them. It's just purely who they are. And they are offering themselves to each other to lay down their lives for each other. A woman is offering her body for her husband to place his seed to carry his children so beautiful. Every act that a man and a woman come together in a marriage is a promise. It's a renewal of their wedding promises, saying, I am yours. I will do anything for you. I will accept your love. And yet, the marital act outside of marriage is never true and never pure, because it's a lie. You're saying with your body, something that your lips and your heart have not done sacramentally. Your body is saying, I am yours, I will die, all of that. But, but you're not in a marriage and you haven't entered that covenant. So it's a lie. And that makes it impure because your body and your mind and your heart and your soul and your relationship to God and to that other person are not all congruent. And that's what makes somebody pure, right? So truth and purity, they go together. And what is pure is beautiful. Take whatever it is that you think is the most beautiful thing in the world. It might be a sunset. It might be a bridge that a person built. It might be a flower. It might be a person. But if you take and you throw dirt all over or pollute whatever that image is, it's, it's no longer beautiful, right? Because it's not purely what it is. It's covered up by something that's less, that's, that's dirty. So true beauty is pure. It emanates purity. You know, if somebody is thinking about like a pornographic image, it's not pure, but it's not beautiful. Because it's not true. I mean, there, all those things, can you see how they all go together? And anything that lacks truth lacks beauty. And anything that lacks truth and beauty lacks love, right? Whatever is lovely, that's beauty, beautiful, right? Think about those things and you'll live that way. You'll be gracious. Whatever is gracious is true and beautiful and loving. It's excellent. It's worthy of praise. Truth, beauty, and love. You know, it's interesting. All I wrote down for this podcast were three phrases. Speak truth, create beauty, answer love. And it came from actually a conversation I had recently with somebody who visited my apartment. They're like, oh my gosh, this is so beautiful. Um, but why? Like you're all alone. Nobody's ever here, you know? And I said, because my purpose in life is to speak truth. Whether or not people listen or they don't, it doesn't matter. I do it for Jesus. And I think of like um, St. Anthony of Padua that used to preach to the fish and stuff, you know, to the birds. 
speaking truth in this world has a power. For example, like when I used to work in exorcism ministry, you could have a possessed person full of demons if you speak truth. It didn't even have to be biblical truth all the time. It could just be real truth. If you spoke truth very gently, the demon would freak out because demons lie, right? So imagine you're just, you're speaking truth in this world and it might be to your three-year-old and nobody else he hears it. You're helping God create truth and beauty in his creation in the world. There's a spirit going out from you into the world that affects everyone. And, you know, my job is to speak truth without compromise, in love, right, gently. But I, you know, I, there was one time in my life I've ever told a lie. I remember I was in high school, I was gonna get in trouble and my older sister told me to do it and I said it and then I like ran to confession. I've never, I just, I've never spoken untruth, right? You might not like me, uh, you might not believe me, but I speak truth, right? I'm a person of very strong principle that way. And I'd rather die before I were to do something that would offend God or hurt another person. So speaking truth is important. And I said, you know, my life is to create beauty. And no, nobody might see this apartment except me, but I create beauty for God as a, as a way of reflecting my own dignity, right? He created me to partake in his truth and to partake in his beauty. I love going into ugly, decrepit places and cleaning it up and making it really beautiful. And if you look at most of my art, I guess that's on a canvas, but like, look at this. It was a decrepit old door that was broken down. It was for $5 at a, at a garage sale. And I finished it up and I spent a year painting it and it's a beautiful icon, several icons on it. That you do something to better the world by just doing little acts of creating beauty, right? I remember Mother Teresa, they would say in like an airplane would go and clean the toilets if they were dirty. When I'm walking around, if you see a piece of trash, pick it up and throw it away. Why? Because if you want to reflect God and his love, you will speak truth and create beauty, right? Create beauty. And to answer in love. What is love? We look back to 1 Corinthians 13, right? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. And love is never rude. It does not seek what's best for oneself, but it seeks what's best for the other. It endures all things. It hopes all things. Love never, ever fails. I'm sure I forgot something in there. But no matter what happens to you in life, even say somebody captures you and throws you in a concentration camp or something, right? You're always free because you're always free to love. So you should always answer in love. It might be somebody punching you or stabbing you in the heart and your answer of love is to choose to forgive them. Even if they're not humble enough to recognize how wrong they were or anything like that, you glorify God just by forgiving and loving them, by bearing fault, their faults and their sin against you patiently, right? Bear wrongs patiently. That's one of the you know, spiritual works of mercy. It goes right along with love is patient, right? You can be patient to answer whatever it is that God is giving you in your life. It might be a process of discernment. You don't know what to do in your life. And yet God asks you to live the theological virtue of love by being patient with God, with his timing, with your own darkness. Sometimes he asks you to be patient with your own brokenness, your own imperfection, you know, to just recognize you are just a little kid that's going to fall sometimes. You know, love is patient. You answer in patience. Love is kind. You answer in kindness. No matter what people say or do, love is not jealous. Sometimes it hurts me more when people I love or I'm around are jealous than if they actually concretely did something against me. 
such a terrible feeling to have somebody be jealous of you. Like you can't, it's so Satan. Satan was jealous of God. Satan was jealous that Jesus came as a man and not an angel, right? Satan was jealous of Our Lady. And so love isn't jealous. You want the other person to glow. You know, I sang a song at the beginning of this and I'm exhausted from my day. If somebody else, one of my nieces came in and did it five times better, I would rejoice that they were glorifying God better, right? I wouldn't be jealous. I know I'm not like the best of anything. But it's just not being jealous. Authentic love does not compete like that. Try to make oneself look better or look right. Love is, is trying to always, you know, what, what do they say? I mean, those are little Facebook sayings. You're always trying to, um, uh, you know, straighten the crown on the other person's head, right? To make them look, look beautiful and good, right? To see the truth of their dignity. Love is, so it's patient, it's kind, it's not jealous, it's meek, it's forgiving, right? It's not pompous, it's not full of oneself, right? It's, it's humble, it's not rude. It's not rude, it's so easy in life to practice the virtue of charity in regards to not being rude. Because everybody, multiple times a day, has interactions with other people. And just by inserting politeness, courteousness, right? Um, not being judgmental of them, but really receiving and answering them in love. Um, by doing that, you're practicing a virtue of charity, right? To say thank you. To recognize the goodness in another person instead of the bad, right? Even if they hurt you, just to recognize that they're fallen. And sometimes they're so tempted by the evil one, they don't even know what they're doing. That's why Jesus on the cross said, you know, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Love doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing. It doesn't walk around. There's a sin called the sin of detraction. And it's, you know, calumny is when you accuse someone of something that's not true. And that's very serious and bad and painful. But there's also a sin of detraction, which is sharing the faults of somebody with somebody who doesn't have a right to know that. Now, maybe your heart is heavy over something going on. You go home and you talk to your sister or your husband or your friend and you ask for advice. But say you're at a public place or you're with a big group of friends. You don't share the faults of even, you know, maybe you had a bad marriage that ended. You don't, you don't spread gossip about other people, right? That's a sin of detraction. Love doesn't do that. Love speaks truth. And truth is speaking a fact that's true to the right person at the right time in love to make them holy. That's what truth is. So we turn now to these images. Because everything that I've been speaking about, truth, beauty, love, where our hearts reside, what we're called to do in, in the world, all of this can be found in perfection in the hearts of Jesus and Mary. The sacred heart of Jesus. Jesus is truth, right? And he is beauty. Like I, if you could have a vision of Christ, just once, I think what you would be blown away by more than anything is the incredible otherworldly beauty that comes from him. But I think it's a beauty that comes from love and truth more than it does by, you know, human, um, you know, attraction. You know, it's not like his nose is a certain way so you'll like it, right? His love is so great, he's beautiful, and he radiates that. And, you know, Our Lady had one heart with Jesus. And if you've listened to any of my other podcasts, I talk all the time about that. That idea of compenetration of hearts, St. Thomas Aquinas talked about it. Where you have two, heart, one, two bodies and one heart. Where two people love each other so much, they become like one heart, right? 
Well, nobody ever personified or lived that more greatly than the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. They were like one. Look, they both have a flame. Jesus has a crown of thorns. Our Lady has a crown of roses. But under those roses are thorns. And their two hearts are so on fire with love, but it's really beautiful because Our Lady's love is Jesus's love. Because, you know, they're like, they're one. The Holy Spirit has made them one. Their hearts are pressed into each other so much that they, they've, they're united. And so Our Lady radiated truth and beauty because of her union with her son, Jesus because of her being full of grace, full of the Holy Spirit, that perfect daughter of the Father, right? And that's our goal. You know, you shouldn't be jealous of the beauty of Our Lady. Our goal is to radiate the same beauty that she is, that she has. And our goal is to radiate the beauty and the truth of Jesus Christ everywhere. You know, you might not be an artist. You might not have that gift of being able to see color well or shape or things like that. But, you know, your kindness and, you know, staying at your mother-in-law's and cleaning her kitchen, even though sometimes she says these little unkind things to you, you know, after a party, that radiates truth and beauty and love to the world. You know, it doesn't have to always be something exteriorly aesthetic. You might not have the gift of teaching, right? So you're not a speaking truth. But when you're caught in a situation where your reputation might be, a, you know, but somebody asks you a question point blank, lying might make you more comfortable or maybe not telling, you know, the whole truth about a situation or your beliefs on something. But if you proclaim truth in that situation, then you're reflecting. Christ and our, our, our mother, whose hearts did this perfectly and fully, all the way to the cross. And then in the resurrection, you know, the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary are as deep as the suffering of Christ took them. Our lady's suffering was his suffering. Those swords in her heart might as well have just been crosses, right? But it made their love that much more deep and profound and full and pure and real. But their hearts are also resurrected. And, you know, the love that they share with us in, in these images, but in reality of the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart, it's a resurrected presence too, where all wounds are made new. You know, you can take a tree and rip a leaf off, and no human can glue or mend or heal that leaf back on. You can't take a flower and rip all the petals off and put it all back together. But God can renew that. You know, even the human body, when you look at like leprosy that Jesus healed, you know, there's some diseases that are so great that the body can't heal itself. But God can right? In one word, he renewed like the lepers in the, in the gospels. And flesh like a baby's grew where they had putrid sores and they were dying. God can create new life. And he can do it physically in us. And he can do it within our hearts. Maybe you have a vice that's really hanging tough within you. Press it to the hearts of Jesus and Mary. They'll heal that putrid vice. They'll help a new, they'll root it out. And going to confession is very important because you're allowing Christ to remove it, right? He leaves us free. So if you don't go to confession and confess it, then it's like you're clinging to it, saying, no, I want this vice. And he lets us have what we want, right, in that regard. But if you allow him to root it out, then he can plant a new virtue within you. You know, God is always renewing the earth. He's making new flowers come forth. I love the spring where you see those new shoots of growth. You're like the baby that I take care of. You know, I, I've had her since she was newborn. I, I did this with many babies I've taken care of, you know, for months or for years. 
every day you never see her little cells develop or her little milestones like all of a sudden one day she's pulling up and she's letting go and she's standing there but like you don't see the increments that make her grow a little bit bigger a little bit stronger you know it's it's invisible grass growing you don't necessarily see and the work of god in the soul you don't always see but he's constantly in the world you don't see it he's renewing the world how does he do it through truth and beauty and love and this month of june when we you know focus on that the ultimate truth and beauty and love of the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary. God asks you and me to become part of that, to actually become part of that answer. He asks us in little ways to proclaim truth, to create beauty, to exude an answer in love. It doesn't matter if people accept it or not. It is super painful to love ardently when those who you love either ignore it or reject it, spurn it, mock it, attack it. And yet, it doesn't dirty the love. What is the love coming from the heart of Jesus and Mary? It's a fire. Anything you throw into fire gets turned into fire, right? And if you throw a lot of stuff, something into it, then it gets bigger and bigger. So the more that people respond, you know, positively, that fire of love in you grows. And the more they respond negatively, it's also ember for your fire. Because you have to more ardently choose to forgive and to love back, right? I really encourage you with the little time that's left in this month to take... You know, a little bit of time with an image of the Sacred Heart and an image of the Immaculate Heart. And ask the Holy Spirit to show you where Jesus and Mary live truth and radiate truth and where they want you to partake of that in your own life. Where Jesus and Mary create beauty in big ways, in little ways, right? And how they want you to make this world a more beautiful place. And I mean, it could be painting an icon. It could be taking out the trash. It could be being silent when you want to grumble. And look at the hearts of Jesus and Mary and see how they radiate authentic love. And ask them to show you how you can enter into that and partake even more of that one love with them. Jesus and Mary do not come with this devotion. They've given us the devotion to the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart, right? They haven't done this so that we can look at a pretty picture on a wall and that's it. They've done it and you can see the wound on Jesus's heart, right? You see Our Lady touching her heart like, come, she's opening it. It's an open door where you can come and enter into it. And let it bathe, take a bath in the hearts of Jesus and Mary. Drink from it. And then carry it out like a chalice, like a tabernacle to the world. That's the purpose of the devotion. is to change you. Think about the Holy Spirit, which is the love between the Father and the Son. It's the love radiating from the hearts of Jesus and Mary. The Holy Spirit can give birth to new gifts in your life. The closer you draw to these two sacred holy hearts, he wants to help you be more wise, knowledgeable, understanding. He wants to give you understanding, right judgment. He wants to give you courage and fortitude. That comes forth from love. Love is the source of fortitude. Maybe you have to say something you know people will reject, but if you love God, you know that his love is asking that. You see a burning house. What gives a mom a courage to run into a burning house? Her love of her child that's stuck. Love is an incredible force, a powerful force that gives great courage. Your love of God and your love of neighbor. 
piety, that reverence, that honor that we owe to God, that wonder and awe at his beauty. Those are all gifts that we receive the closer we draw to the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary. And the fruits of that love take root in our lives. Peace, humility, faith, hope, and love, joy, meekness, generosity, chastity, modesty, self-control, gentleness, strength. These are all things that you receive to the degree that you think about, and then you reach out and you touch and you embrace and you allow the grace of God to fill you with the hearts and the love of Jesus and Mary. The closer you draw to the hearts of Jesus and Mary, the more you will just have right judgment because you're thinking truth, right? The more that you will radiate the beauty of God and appreciate it. One of the saints once, I think maybe it was Francis de Sales, I don't remember, but cried out, you know, Lord, make the flowers be silent. I'm losing my mind in love. Every time he looked at the flowers, it's, and I understand that because I, I get so full of the love of God by just looking at a flower. But they proclaim that beauty and that, that holiness of God, the majesty. The closer you draw to Jesus and Mary, like I've said before, it's like drawing close to a fire that warms you. You can't not be warmed, softened, enlightened filled, transformed. Think about how when you are around a person who really loves you, how it changes everything. That's what the hearts of Jesus and Mary are supposed to be for us. And they give us that atmosphere of love that then help us grow the other virtues and to radiate and share that to other people. You know, in John's gospel, Jesus said many times, remain in my love, right? I am the vine, you are the branches. Unless you remain in me and I in you, then you will not bear fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing without the heart of Jesus and the heart of Mary helping you. So remaining in their love allows their truth and their beauty and their love to flow out from you to other people. And that's the purpose of this devotion, this double devotion of the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart of Mary here this, this June, right? And in July, then, we'll go into the, the month of the precious blood of Christ, which is so beautiful and so powerful. Why? Because it, it takes his heart and it, it flows out of his heart, you know? And it's like his little pieces of his heart falling upon you. You know, the blood and the heart, they're like one. They're, you know, they're, those cells are so connected. So if you take some moments before this month is done and you, you focus and you meditate and you pray and you allow that the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary to speak their truth to you and through you, to create their beauty in you and through you, to love you and through you, then when this next month comes up of the precious blood, then you'll be able to receive that blood more deeply and, and allow it to be spread from you to others around you. I'll, I'll be sure to do a podcast on the precious blood in July. So with this, I just want to end with a prayer. And I want to ask you, Lord, that you pour out that flame of your divine love that comes from the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary and every soul that listens to this and every soul that we are praying for, that we think about. We ask you to help our lives always proclaim truth, always exude and create beauty, always answer everything you give to us with your unfathomable love. And I'm going to, at the end, I don't usually do this, I'm going to sing that song again. Because we're asking the Holy Spirit to breathe on us, right? 
We're asking him to, to breathe his breath of love on us. And it's that breath of love that will fill us with the truth and the beauty and the love that we need to have hearts that match theirs, right? So let us sing. the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end amen Jesus meek and humble of heart make our hearts like unto thine sacred heart of Jesus have mercy on us immaculate and sorrowful heart of Our Lady pray for us good Saint Joseph pray for us all of your holy angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Thank you.